All right, guys, sincerely, it's hard to believe that we are already in our ninth study. So this is number nine. And uh, by God's grace, we'll continue to work our way through all these different areas of systematic theology, and all of us will be equipped, amen? amen? All right, how many of you have ever taken a course on anthropology in the past? Okay, I see a, a few hands here and there. All right, so when I was at Western Washington University, I had the opportunity because of my major to join into some very upper level classmen anthropology classes. And I was thinking about this today. Out of all the different areas where I was in, I mean, I was in biology class and different things like that, psychology, I had to take some upper level psychology classes for my major. Um, when I told people, when they went around the room and they asked people what they wanted to do after, after university, and most people were going into like the field being secular anthropologists. When I said I wanted to be a missionary overseas, they grew fangs and claws, I kid you not, and almost wanted to kill me. And it was so, out of all the classes that I went to, and I was, just, I was, I was bold, but I was dumb. <laughs> And those two, that combination isn't, doesn't work really well in a secular university. So I kid you not, I had so many people surround me and just say, are you going to go and destroy cultures by bringing them the white man's religion? And first off, it's not the white man's religion. But anyway, so all that to say is, yes, I've taken those classes in anthropology. And what we're going to be studying tonight is a little bit different. All right. Little bit different. This is, this is God's view of man, not man's view of man. And whenever we have man's view of man, we're going to get off track, right? We're going to start bowing down to worshiping idols of ourselves. And if you don't know the living God, then that's who you're worshiping. You're worshiping yourself. You're, you're bowing down at a little graven image of you, what you want God to be like. All right, let's start off, you guys. I can keep going on with my stories, but then we would be way out of time, so. The study of man is called anthropology. From the Greek word anthropos, meaning man, there's your blank, and logos, meaning word or discourse, hence anthropology is a discourse, or rather, a study about man from a biblical standpoint, and that's the anthropology that we want to look at. Since the doctrine of man can only come from scripture, then a difference between biblical anthropology and sociological anthropology, what I studied, is patently obvious. And here's a really good quote. It is better then to recognize at the outset two contrasting possibilities in the anthropology. Number one, that in which man is simply set in relation to himself and his world. And number two, that in which man is also and primarily set in relation to God. On the one side is scientific anthropology in the sense of an empirical study of man in his world. On the other is theological or biblical anthropology in the sense of a study of man in God's world. It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. So do not get confused thinking, oh, I took anthropology up at, in, in the university. <laughs> this is not the same anthropology. So thus, only a study of God's word can furnish a complete and accurate answer to the timeless question of, what is man? And that's your blank. What is man? Going on with this next quote, the question, what is man, challenges every age, but no age knows so much and so many things about man as does ours. You might want to underline, and yet, no age knows less than ours, what man really is. Having lost his awareness of God, modern man has set his sights on human existence as the one worthy object of his concern. All I can say is how sad, but how true. How true. So let's begin our study with man by asking the obvious question of why. Why in the world did God create us, right? Why did he create man? Now think about this. God did not need to create man, that's your blank. God did not create us because he was lonely or needed, needed fellowship. God does not need us for any reason. I think we need to be very clear about that. But he did create us for his own 
glory. Let's look at this verse. These are two really good verses, but Isaiah 43, 7. Excuse me, excuse me, let me read this for us. It says this, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Very, very clear. God made you for his glory. Therein lies the answer to the question, and this is really the key. That is the key to answering that question. What is our purpose in life? Well, our purpose must be to fulfill the reason that God created us, and that is to glorify him. Again, that is why you have been placed here in this world, to glorify him. Not to glorify yourself, right? Um, or anything else in this world, but to glorify him. So then we need to figure out, well, how does that work? So there are probably about a dozen verses right after that. I would encourage you guys to look those up. When we realize that God created us to glorify him and when we start to act in ways that fulfill that purpose, then we begin to experience an intensity of joy in the Lord that we have never before known. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. When, when I start fulfilling the purpose from, for which my creator made me, then I have more joy than I ever had in the first 21 years combined, right, of trying to selfishly please myself. It lasted for a few seconds or minutes, moments, whatever it is, and then it's gone again. Dear friend, that is so very, very true. That is really the truth about life. And I sincerely hope and pray that it's true of you as well, each one of you. The next question that we want to look at when discussing the creation of man is how. All right, so let's look at 2A, the the origin of man. The Bible teaches that God created the entire universe in six 24-hour days. That's Genesis 1 and 2. And there are several indicators in the creation account to validate this thesis or, yeah, this thought. For example, number one, the Hebrew word for day, yom, appearing with a, numeric, with a numeral, excuse me, always designates a 24-hour day. That's number one. Number two, the phrase evening and morning, found there in verse 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, 31, emphasize a 24-hour day. And then the Exodus 28 through 11 emphasize a literal six-day creation by analogy. In commanding man to labor in six days and rest on the seventh day as, as God did, God created in six days to give us an example, right? That's why he did it. And this is called, in your notes there, fiat creation, which has two key aspects. Number one, God created directly by divine decree. It's your blank. And number two, God created instantaneously. After the world was complete, God created man. On day what? Day six. The only part of his creation made specifically in, here's your blank, God's image. From Genesis, from the Genesis account arises some essential truths about man's origin. Again, number one, God directly created man. He did not evolve from a lower life form. See that in Genesis 1, 2, 5, Deuteronomy 4. You know, that's a theory of evolution. Or as I Heard it said in the past, from goo to you. (laughs) I like that one. Christ affirmed the same truth in Matthew 19, 4. Number two, both man and woman were, were created directly through, though differently, by God. And God specifically created them male and female. We'll talk about more, that more later. Number three, God created man as a uniquely moral being, accountable to God and made in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. Now, folks, listen. There is so very, very much more that could be said about, again, the how of creation, all right? And I used to teach this aspect of theology in Berlin. I helped start a, a, Bible, sc- a Bible school in Berlin. It's called the European Bible Training Center, and it's still going strong today. Um, and it's called cosmology. If you're still interested in this topic, then I would encourage you to check out the Apologetics Forum, 
All right, is Heinz Laclama here tonight? Where's Heinz? Oh, there's Heinz. <laughs> okay, Heinz is the founder, president of Apologetics Forum, um, and, uh, and we hold at least once a month, typically we have a Thursday night speaker that Heinz brings in guest speakers typically. I think four times a year outside of wherever he wants to fly them into here. And they speak basically throughout the week and usually we'll get them once or twice uh, throughout that time. But there's all kinds of opportunities there to learn more about cosmology. So I purposefully did not do any more than just to, to put your toe into that, into that water this evening on that aspect because there's so much more that we could say. So I would direct them to, to Heinz. Heinz, can you stand up real quick, do you mind? So you guys know Heinz. So if you want to know more about the apologetic form, then please talk to Heinz. All right, you guys, let's keep moving on. Thank you. I did not prep you in saying I was going to do that. As mentioned already, God created man in his own image, which is different than everything else that he created in our world, and as far as we know, in the universe. And if you think about it, what a tremendous privilege that entails, correct? to be the only part of God's creation that we know of, at least, in this, at least in this world we know, to be made in God's image is a huge privilege. The fact that man was made in the image of God sets him apart from all creation. It's, a, it's of enormous import in our understanding of who God made man to be. But exactly what does it mean to be made in God's image? And that's what I want to talk to you all about next. We're talking about God's study of man, right? So let's first define it. It's number 1B in your outline. Being made in the, in the image of God means that man is in certain ways like God and representing God. Genesis 1.26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in what? Our image according to our likeness. So our image, our likeness. So both Hebrew words for image and the one for likeness refer to something that is similar, that's your blank, but not identical to the thing it represents. When scripture says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, it would have simply meant to the original readers, let us make man to be like us and to represent us. It's a really good commentary on that. The more fully we understand who God is, the more similarities we will recognize and the more fully we will understand what being made in the image of God actually means. And note the similarity between Genesis 1.26 and 5.3. In 5.3 it says this, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness. Sound familiar? What about this? According to his image and named him Seth. Now, that's really interesting. Seth was not identical to Adam, that's your blank, but he was like him, just like when we have sons and daughters. They're like us, they're not identical to us. Scripture does not specify exactly how Seth was like Adam, and it would be overly restrictive for us to assert that one or another characteristic determined the way in which Seth was in the image of Adam. So to assert that man being made in the image of God means only, for example, the power to make moral decisions would limit the meaning too much. And I hope to show you how much more broad this really is tonight. We're gonna to spend actually quite a bit of time talking about the image of God, what that all means. So let's begin our discussion of what it means to be made in the image of God by looking at the immaterial aspects of man. All right, this is number 2B. So the immaterial aspects. Unlike the animals, God created man with an immaterial, that is a spiritual nature, as well as a material, physical one. At this point, the question arises, are man's soul and spirit distinct, or are they the same? And largely three views exist, each good, each having godly men standing behind them. So let's look at these, and maybe you've already settled this in your, own, in your own mind. The first view is the view of man is, a, is that he is a dichotomous creature. 
dichotomy. Dichotomy comes from the Greek word dika, meaning two, and temno, to cut. Hence, man is a two-part being. In other words, he can be cut in two, right? Consisting of body and then also of soul and spirit. Support for dichotomous view is as follows. Genesis 2-7 affirms only two parts, that's your blank, at the point of creation. God formed man from dust from the ground, right? That was his body. And then he breathed life into him and he became, the Bible says, a living soul. The words soul and spirit are used interchangeably in the scriptures. There's a number of passages there to prove that. And then body and soul or body and spirit are often mentioned together as, con as constituting the entire person. So that's the, that's the support for a view that man is comprised of two parts, right? Body and then soul and spirit, however you want to do that. All right, the second view is that man is made up of three parts. This view is called trichotomy, or he is a trichotomous being. Trichotomy comes from the Greek words trica, meaning three, and temno, again, to cut. Hence, man is a three-part being consisting of, here it is, body, number two is soul, and number three is spirit. The soul and spirit are said to be different. That's the key in function and substance. The body being world conscience, the soul being self-conscious, and the spirit being god conscience. The soul is seen as a lower power consisting of man's imagination, memory, and understanding. The spirit is a higher power consisting of reason, conscience, and will. And support for the trichotomous view is as follows. Here it is. Paul seems to emphasize a three-part view in, in spirit and soul and body and des desiring the sanctification of the entire person according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. According to Hebrews 4.12 implies a distinction between soul and spirit. When it says the division of soul and spirit, right? The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3, 4 can be seen to suggest a threefold classification, natural, fleshly, carnal, soulish, and spiritual. However, this is a very weak argument. I'll tell you what I believe in a second. Let's go on with a third one. The third view is to see man as a multifaceted being or creature. This view holds that man's spiritual nature is more complex than simply two or three aspects. Instead, a person's inner self can be understood as multifaceted. And the support for a multifaceted view is this. Although soul and spirit are common terms used to describe the non-material nature of man, there are at least four other terms, it's your blank, used in scripture to describe man's spiritual nature. What are they? Here they are. Heart, conscience, mind, and will. So we see that all throughout scripture, these, these other areas. And so here's a nice chart also put into your notes there, the three different views. You see the dichotomy, trichotomy, multifaceted view, and then everything on the very far right, what they're made up of. So you get an idea there. Now listen, I personally hold to a dichotomous view. Okay, I'm a died in the wool dichotomous. So, um, it seems clear to me that God has made man in two parts. And with soul and spirit being used throughout scripture interchangeably. Soul or spirit, soul or spirit, spirit or soul, spirit or soul. So if there is a, a distinction to be made, as some would say, the Bible never tells it to us. It's usually a psychologist who is a dyed-in-the-wool trichotomous because he wants to have a reason for doing what he does. Does that make sense? So if you have a, a Christian counselor, 99 out of 100 times, these people are going to be trichotomous, all right? And they're going to say the pastor can take care of the soul, but we psychologists take care of the spirit. Does that make sense? So it lends legitimacy to their practice in their, mind, in their mind's eye. But again, there are other good people who hold to this. It, that's just what I've found over the years. But typically biblical counselors, um, people who say we just believe in what God's word says, they are most typically dichotomous. 
All right, moving on. So the non-material nature has several different aspects to it. All, that's your blank, of which are part of being made in the image of God. So we're still talking about those non-material aspects. So let's talk about first and foremost about the spiritual aspect. God is a spirit, correct? And the human soul is a spirit. In making man in his image, God endowed him with those attributes which belong to his own nature as a spirit. Man is thereby distinguished from all other inhabitants of this world and raised immeasurably above them. Why? Because they've been made in his image as a necessary condition of our capacity to know God and is therefore the foundation of our religious nature. If we were not like God, we could not know God. We would be like the animals which die and completely cease to be. Instead, we have a spiritual life that enables us to relate to God as persons, to pray and praise him, and to understand his word, which he gave us. So we are different. God made us different than the animals, right? Can we see a difference? I know a lot of, sorry, I'll be nice. People in certain big cities can't see the distinction, <laughs> right, between people and animals. But God very much says that we are very, very much different than the animals. Now, in addition to the spiritual aspect is the eternal aspect. There's another difference between us and the animals. We also have immortality in the sense that we will never cease to exist. Kids, you realize that? That you will, you will never cease to exist? Now, you did have a beginning, all right? But... None of us will ever cease to exist. It says our spirits will live forever after our earthly body dies. Man has an awareness of the distant future, an inward sense that we will live beyond the time of our physical death, a sense that gives many people desire to attempt to be right with God before they die. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that. So if a person knows God, then what a joyful expectation that we will live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, you guys get the idea. But think of this, for the person who does not know the Lord, what a terrifying prospect of living forever and ever and ever without ever coming to know God, right? Living away from Him. So there's that aspect that we as humans hold in, in ourselves that's different than our cats and dogs, all right? Then there's the moral aspect of our immaterial part of being made in the image of God. Man was created in a state of what theologians call original righteousness. Though this original righteousness was lost through the fall, we still have an inner sense of right and wrong, right? That is our conscience, Romans 2.15. And that sets us apart from the animals and makes us morally culpable or responsible to God for our actions, I expect my dogs and cats to act like animals, okay? They do. They do some horrible things. <laughs> That's just my dogs and cats. But people are different. God holds us morally culpable. When we act in obedience to God's standards, our likeness to God is reflected in holy, righteous behavior. But by contrast, our unlikeness to God is reflected whenever we sin. Another aspect of being made in the image of God is the mental aspect. How about this? Immaterial aspect. We're talking, still talking about the immaterial side of what it means to be made in the image of God. Okay, we, we good there? There's a mental aspect to that. We, as humans, have an ability to reason. That is to think logically and to learn on a level that sets us apart from the animals. Beavers build the same types of dams that they've built for thousands of generations. Birds make the same types of nests. And bees have the same types of hives. But man continues to develop greater skill and complexity in technology, agriculture, science, and every other field of endeavor. We have the, the ability to be creative and innovative in areas such as art, music, literature. And mankind's use of complex abstract languages sets us apart, far apart from the animals. There's also a relational aspect to being created in the image of God. 
In addition to our unique ability to relate to God, man can also have deep relationships within marriage, within a family, with his children, with friends, and in a church body, amen? This ability is a reflection of the fellowship, there's your blank, which the members of the Trinity have with each other. That's also an aspect of being made in the image of God, is that we can have true fellowship with one another. Man is also like God in his relationship to the rest of creation. Specifically, man has been given the right to rule over the rest of creation, working with it, developing it, using it. Unless, of course, the lefties are in charge. <laughs> then you can't even look at it. Sorry. I've, I'm just, I'm having fun here, so just don't take it personally, please. Okay, what about this one? Man is unique in that we have personality. Man has a self-awareness and personality lifting him above the realms, the realm of animals. In the complexity of emotions man expresses, we can see that human beings are far different from the rest of creation. Are our emotions far more complex than the animals? You better believe they are. Again, that's what separates us. We've been made in the image of God. Not just that we have certain moral attitudes. That's just one aspect. Furthermore, man has been gifted by God with a will. Man is born with a self-determination will that enables him to make complicated and non-material choices. He can choose what he does with his body, what he thinks about with his mind, how he responds to his emotions, and how he relates to God. This is very different from the instinct-driven manner in which animals live. And this ability to choose is important because it renders man capable of redemption. And all I can say to that is amen. So folks, we've got a will. You've not been created as a, an automaton. You know what that is, right? It's a robot. Somebody programmed you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Right? You've been created with a will. You didn't create us as an animal either, just with simple instincts. Right? Smell something in the wind and you hightail it out of there. <laughs> you know, we're like, what is that again? Hmm. Looking around. So whatever it might be, right? Or you know it's time to fly south for the wintertime, right? All right, being made in the image of God also includes, here's a kind of a shocker maybe, physical aspects. You ever think about that before? F scripture makes it a distinction between the physical soul and spirit, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 1, 1 Thessalonians 5, and the physical, the body. Genesis 2, 7 tells us the body of man was formed from the dust of the ground. There's a definite play on words in the Hebrew language. I love this. The Lord God formed man. You know what that is? Hebrew word is Adam. Of dust from the ground, Adama, right? And the very name, Ad, the very name Adam was to remind man of his origin. Where are we from? From the earth, the dirt, right? The dust, however you want to say that. That's what we are, right? That's all we are. It goes right back, it goes right back to it. In contrast, God created the woman from man's rib. So although her chemical makeup was the exact same as Adam's, she is more closely identified with her husband's body than with the dust of the earth. A chemical analysis of the human body reveals that man's components are those of the earth, calcium, iron, potassium, and so forth. Moreover, at death, the body again unites with the dust from which it had its origin. It's crazy that you think about it is that we are nothing but very comple complex dirt particles put together, right? <laughs> With all this information holding us together, it's all God's sovereignty. In life, however, the body is intrinsically involved with glorifying God since a believer's body is the temple of specifically the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, God, the Holy Spirit. The body is not the master so that the believer caters to it. That's how a lot of us used to live. Nor is it an enemy that needs to be punished. That's how some people think. The body rather is to be submitted to God, according to Romans 12, 1, in order that Christ may be glorified in that body. Amen? 
Again, you've been created to do what? Glorify God in all aspects of us, soul and spirit, the immaterial, and your body as well. In heaven, the believer will one day be rewarded for deeds done in the body, according to 2 Corinthians 5.10. We should not think that our physical bodies Im imply that God has a body. Okay, that's not what we're saying. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. However, here's a big however, there are ways in which our bodies reflect something of God's character. Now, that's interesting. Man himself as a whole is created in the image of God, not just his spirit, correct? He said, hey, let us create man in, in our own image according to our own likeness. For example, we see with our eyes. Does God also see? He does. Far more than we could ever see, Genesis 16, 13, 1 Samuel 6, 7, Psalm 33. We hear with our ears. God also hears. The psalmist also rejoices in this fact. There's some psalms there. We rejoice with our mouths, and our God is a God who speaks. As a matter of fact, he spoke it all into existence. Our God-given ability to bear and raise children who are like ourselves is also a reflection of God's ability to create human beings who are in some ways like himself, are created in his own likeness. Our physical bodies are a very important part of our existence, as a matter of fact, they're so important that they will be transformed when Christ returns and they will continue to be a part of us for how long? All of eternity. Listen, I'm so happy this is not my eternal body. Aren't you guys? <laughs> Listen, if you're over 30, you're thankful. All right, that's your blank there, eternity. So... What happened to the image of God after the fall of man? And that's a good question. So thanks for asking it. Here it is, number 4B, image of God distorted but not lost. At this point, the theological question arises, could man still be considered to bear the image of God after the fall, that is after man's sin? And the scripture clearly indicates that man does still bear the image of God. Because some people say, well, it's been lost forever. Right? Once man fell, the image of God has been lost. But that can't be true. And I'll tell you why. Genesis 9, 6, which comes after the fall, says this, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood, sh blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made him. Does that pretty much solve that? Even though men are sinful, there is still enough likeness to God remaining in them that to murder, that's your blank, another person is to attack the part of creation that, God, that most resembles God. The New Testament also confirms that man still bears the image of God, James 3, 9. Talking about our tongues, with it, our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made, What? in the likeness of God. Listen, after you guys just ate, I need to keep you awake, so. It's really hard to be the speaker after lunch in a conference, it really does, it really is. You can totally tell, totally tell. So even after the fall, we are still in God's image. So James makes this point that how we speak about God's image bears matters. And that's your blank. How we speak about other people matters. However, having said all of that, it is also sadly true that the image of God in us is distorted. We are less like God than we were before the entrance of sin. Do you, would you agree with that? For sure. Therefore, we can see the image more closely in the nature of Adam and Eve before the fall, and you can. So what does the future hold for the image of God in those of us who have been redeemed? And are you guys ready for some really good news? I am too. Here's the good news. Even though God's image is distorted and fallen man, our redemption in Christ means that we can, even in this life, progressively grow more and more into the likeness of God, to the likeness of our Savior. And that should encourage you to be a part of a, a good church home, right? That teaches you, trains you, disciples you, pushes you on and to be that. Colossians 3.10, how about this? And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. 
or 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are, here's what's true of us, being transformed into the same image, praise God, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Hey, God is transforming us. He is progressively making us more and more like Jesus Christ. That is called progressive sanctification. And every true believer, God says he always um, finishes what he starts, right? He began a good work in you. We'll see it to completion. Friend, do you understand that the goal for which God has redeemed us is that we might be, according to Romans 8, 29, conformed to the image of his son? All right, it says it right there, Romans 8, 29. Go read it. And then one day, according to 6b, it's going to be completely restored. The fullest measure of man's creation in the image of God is seen in Jesus Christ. At your blank. In Jesus, we see human likeness to God as it was intended to be. Colossians 1.15 tells us, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It's the firstborn of all of us. But the glorious promise of the New Testament is that we too shall be like Christ. The process of restoring that broken image will take a lifetime. And it will be culminated when we step into eternity and see our Savior face to face. Amen? Again, I cannot wait. I cannot wait until that glorious day then when we get to see God face to face. And he finishes what he began in us. It's been a painful um, existence, like painful but glorious existence as a believer, right? Because God shows you things like, man, as an unbeliever, I just run away from that stuff. <laughs> but now as a believer, I got to be confronted with this stuff. I don't like it. It hurts my pride. It hurts my ego. All, everything else. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 is next. It says this, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. How about one more? 1 John 3, 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. You can underline that, because we will see him just as he is. How cool is that? Praise the Lord. The animals, the insects, the birds, they don't have that promise. You guys, but we do. All the the starry host and the heavenlies don't have that promise, but we do. Something absolutely uniquely amazing of being made in the image of God. And that is who we are. We are God's image bearers. And so we should do it well, amen? Okay, you, ready? you guys ready for a, a very encouraging quote? Here it is, under 7b. It would be good for us to reflect on our likeness to God more often. Amen to that. It will probably amaze us to realize that when the creator of the universe wanted to create something in his image, something more like himself than all the rest of creation, he made us. This realization will give us a profound sense of dignity and significance as we reflect on the excellence of all the rest of God's creation. The starry universe, the abundant earth, the world of plants and animals, the angelic kingdoms are remarkable, even magnificent. I want you to underline this next sentence. But we are more like our creator than any of these things. We are the culmination of God's infinitely wise and skillful work of creation. Now, don't get proud. <laughs> man and woman, brother and sister. Even though sin has greatly marred that likenessly, we nonetheless now reflect much more of it and shall even more as we grow in likeness to Christ. All I can think after that is amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Every human being has the status of being in God's image. Now here's the practical outworking, what this means for all of us, okay? This is now how we should think. Get ready. No matter how much that image is marred by sin, illness, weakness, or age. We've all been made in the image of God, right? From the very youngest to the very oldest. As soon as, as, soon as uh, um, you are formed in your mother's womb and you take your last breath, right? All in between. This has profound implications for our conduct towards others. Oh, it does. 
It means that people of every nationality deserve equal dignity and rights. It means that elderly people, those seriously ill, the mentally handicapped, and children yet unborn deserve full protection and honor as human beings. Amen. To that amen. Those who deny this unique status as image bearers of the true God soon begin to depreciate the value of human life and tend to see humans as merely a higher form of animals. That's what our society is pushing. Hard. But for the believer who looks into the scripture to answer the question, who am I? The knowledge that he is an image bearer of the living God he loves should bring him not only a sense of dignity and worth, but also of great joy. And I know we keep saying amen, but I really, really mean that. This is a huge, huge implications for us, what this all means. A lot of implications to that, all right? What it means to be made in the image of God. It's a huge responsibility with that. And I hope all of you would take that serious. And I really mean, and all that that entails. Now, the next area of anthropology that we want to look at are the two genders that God made for the whole human race, right? <laughs> he created two genders, male and female. And simply that state, statement alone, I'll probably get kicked off YouTube. <laughs> so be it. It's theologically fascinating to notice that in the same verse, the same sentence, practically in the same breath, we read that God created man in his image and he created mankind male and female and let no one deceive you. Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Yeah, I never ever, if somebody asked me like five years ago, would I ever be like, emphasizing something like this, I never thought we'd have to do that. <laughs> never thought I'd live in the day when this would be an issue of confusion, right? Why did God create two sexes? Are they equally his image bearers? How does that affect their roles? Now, there are three main views which attempt to answer these questions. Number one is the egalitarian view, that's the feminist view, and they believe that men and women are of equal value and therefore, they should have equal access to all roles in the church and family. Did you catch the problem? Let's keep going on. Number two is the traditional or hierarchical view. This gives lip service to the equal value of women, but maintains that men, that's your blank, should hold positions superior to women in every aspect of society. Then comes the biblical or the complementarian view. And this view says that men and women are absolutely equal in value. But they've been given by God completely different roles in the church and the family. Now, notice that I said have been given by God. It's not for man to decide. It's not for society to, to, to evolve and change and grow and, you know, and, and be more enlightened as, you know, as we go on. But that's what I see people doing all the time or suggesting. Now let's dig into some specifics with regards to the complementarian or the biblical view of man and woman. And uh, I'll give you some book recommendations at the end here that if you want... Um, would be really good in discussing this. But we're going to talk about the biblical view. So let's talk about the equality in personhood. Men and women are equally made in God's image. Genesis 127, 5, 1 through 2. Hence, they're equally important and valuable in God's eyes, both now and for all of eternity. Amen. In this belief, Christianity stands alone among the religions and cultures of the world. Ladies, do you realize that? Biblical Christianity has, has done more to lift up women than any other religion or culture in the entire world over the entire um, uh, course of world history. And I really mean that. In a biblical worldview, one gender is not better than the other. Now, even though men and women are fully equal in worth, they nevertheless have been given, been given different roles. And this is number 2B. 
To understand the difference in the roles of men and women, we must look to the relationship amongst the members of the Trinity. That's the key. Do we see different roles in the Trinity? And the answer is, you betcha. <laughs> Differences in the roles and authority amongst the members of the Trinity are completely consistent with equal importance, equal personhood, and equal deity. Does that make sense? You kind of see where we're going with this. In redemption, the Father sends the Son into the world, and the Son comes as, an, as excuse me, and is obedient to the Father and dies to pay for our sins. Luke 22, Philippians 2. After the Son has ascended into heaven, He sends the Holy Spirit who comes to equip and empower the church. God didn't leave us as orphans here in this world. Praise the Lord for that. There is clearly an exercise of authority on the Father's part as he sends the Son to earth. And then the Son sends the Spirit to earth. Yet nowhere in that interchange was there any loss, that's your blank, of deity or lessening of importance of any person of the Trinity. Love it how God did this for us. If human beings reflect the character of God, which we do, then we would expect similar differences in roles among them, which we do. Just as God the Father has authority over the Son, though the two are equal in deity, so in a marriage the husband has authority over the wife, though they are equal in personhood. 1 Corinthians 11.3, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of woman, and God is the head of Christ. There it is right there. So let's talk about the, th that, about the pre-fall existence of roles. Were these distinctions between male and female roles part of the original creation? Or, as some would suggest, were they a part of the punishment after the fall? And that's where most people would fall under. That's what they would say. It says this in Genesis 3.16, Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And the answer to this question carries immense theological repercussions. Those who support the idea that the distinction in roles came after, that's your blank, the fall, believe that differing roles are the result of sin. So, reason why men have been given the, the headship role and women the submissive role is because of sin. And so then they say, because we've come to Christ, we can do away with those roles. Therefore, we should live today according to God's original plan with no distinction in roles as it was with Adam and Eve. They say that as well. This view is unbiblical for a number of reasons. Let's talk about this. This goes on for a couple pages, so, so just keep this in mind, what we're, what we're dealing with. First, Adam was created to begin with. The fact that God first created Adam and then after a period of time created Eve strongly suggests that God saw Adam as having a leadership role in his family. So we're just going to walk through the creation account here and show you how that possibly cannot be the case. The creation of Adam first is consistent with the Old Testament pattern of primogeniture. You guys have it all in there so you can learn how to pronounce it. That is the idea that the firstborn in any generation in a human family has leadership in the family for that generation. That idea of the firstborn is biblical, all right? That idea is biblical and it's found in scripture. And in the New Testament, Paul uses the fact that Adam was formed first, then Eve, and I quote that, as a reason for restricting governing and teaching roles in the church to men. As a matter of fact, he says, hey, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And he says, he goes right into this. He says, for Adam was, first, was formed first and then Eve. Next we read in scripture specifically, he goes on, but we'll stop there. Next we read in scripture specifically in the creation account that Eve was created as a helper for Adam. That was her role to begin with in a perfect world. Genesis 2.18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Is it a bad thing to be a helper, you guys? Do you know God identifies himself as a servant, as a helper? Not a bad thing at all. 
1 Corinthians 11, 9, for indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. These verses are in no way teaching lesser importance. However, they do indicate that there was a difference in roles from the beginning, and that's your blank. Now, the noun helper in Genesis 2.18, Hebrew is here, means help, support, aid. It is the key word, this is a, 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 a quote here, used to describe the woman's role. This is not a demeaning term. God is frequently described as a help to his people, Psalm 121. To be a helper means that the woman has the necessary ability, fitness, resources, and strength to be a help, Proverbs 31. The woman was created for the man's sake, not vice versa, 1 Corinthians 11, 9. It comes from Alexander Strauch. Next, we're told from the creation account that Adam named Eve. Adam gave names to all the animals, indicating Adam's authority over the animal kingdom. Because in Old Testament thought, the right to name someone implied authority over that person. And this is seen, seen when God gave names to people such as Abraham and Sarah, or when parents give names to their children. A Hebrew name typically designated the character or function of the one named. I love Hebrew names. Adam was specifying the characteristics or functions of the animals he named. Therefore, when Adam said, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, according to Genesis 2.23 and 3.20, it indicated a leadership role on his part. This leadership role was true before the fall. She shall be called woman in Genesis 2.23. And after the fall, the man called his wife's name Eve, Genesis 3.20. Next, we read that God named the human race man, not woman. The fact that God named the human race with a term that also referred to Adam in particular, or man in distinction from woman, suggests a leadership role given by God to the man. You guys, when we get to heaven, we're going to see all different classifications of angels in heaven. Some will be given leadership roles, some will be given different roles. But we're not going to think like, oh, that poor, um, a lower angel, right? Or what we think. We will think perfectly, never will be, there je be jealousy anymore of anyone. And so that will be a great place to live in, right? <laughs> this is similar to the custom of a woman taking her husband's last name. It signifies his headship. Next. The Bible tells us that the serpent came to Eve first. Now, we're still walking through all these reasons, and these are all just in the biblical text. Satan, in his effort to undermine God's plans, approached Eve first in an attempt to institute, institute a role reversal by tempting Eve to take the leadership in obeying God, or disobeying God, excuse me. Why did he go to Eve first? Did you think about that? He had a plan. He had a plan. Thank you, Sharon. Paul seemed to have had this role reversal in mind when he said, and it was not Adam who was deceived by the woman, excuse me, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And again, that's that, the second reason why he says, I do not allow a woman to teach or have authority over man, basically in the church, all right? Next, we see in God's word that God spoke to Adam first. In contrast to Satan, and in keeping with the man's leadership role, God spoke to Adam first, both before and after the fall. Notice this, Genesis 2, 15 through 17, and then Genesis 3, 9. As the leader of his family, Adam was to be called to account first for what happened to the family. Guys, guess what? Whether you like it or not, you have that role. You have that role in your family. And God will one day hold you accountable to that, right? Now, none of us are perfect, so thank God for his grace, right, and his mercy. And we grow into that. So ladies, have patience with us as guys. We're slow learners sometimes. But God's given that to us. So take that seriously, men. And if you don't know how to be a good leader, then ask someone to help you. Ask somebody to help you, to disciple you. Not many of us have had really good role models growing up right? And we're not going to, can't use that as an excuse to perpetuate that to the next generation. 
But guys, if you're older and you have, and you have time to invest in somebody younger, then do that, right? Finally, the Bible clearly tells us that Adam, not Eve, represented the human race. Even though Eve sinned first, Genesis 3, 6, we are counted sinful because of what? Because of Adam's sin. Do you realize that? In Adam, all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Romans 5, 12 through 21. So it's clear. It's clear. Look at the next section here. The curse brought about a distortion of previous roles, not the introduction of new roles. That is so crucial to understand, men, women, all right? It's not an introduction of a new role since the fall came about. It's simply a distortion. It's going to make things harder than how God originally intended them. So let's keep going on. In the punishment, punishments God gave to Adam and Eve, he did not introduce new roles, but simply introduced pain and distortion into the roles they already had. Adam would still till the ground. That's your blank. But the ground would bear thorns and thistles now. Eve would still bear children, but doing so would be a painful experience. The fall also introduced conflict and pain into the previously harmonious relationship by Eve's new desire to rebel against Adam's authority. Genesis 3.16 says this, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's why there's conflict. The word translated desire means desire to conquer. You go to Genesis 4.1 and keep reading about that. Adam will misuse his authority by ruling harshly over his wife, which introduces pain and conflict into a relationship that was previously harmonious. This does not imply a role change, simply a sad distortion of the roles already put in place. Opposite distortions of the biblical pattern can also occur within the marriage relationship. So instead of being the domineering type, right, the opposite can occur. The opposite of leadership by the husbands are the sins of passivity or laziness. I think that's our culture now. It used to be the opposite. It used to be the domineering, all right? But now I think our culture has really worked really, really hard at getting rid of that. In Germany, you see the same thing after, after uh, the, the Third Reich, the Nazism and all that stuff. You really see that. So it goes on. He can become a wimp. Or a husband may become so considerate of his wife that he allows her to make all the decisions and even agrees when she urges him to do, to do wrong, like Adam. Remember Ahab, his wife Jezebel, Solomon, all these guys. The husband can also become absent emotionally or physically or spiritually, you can add, from the home. Guys, that is not our role. God has called us to a different role. Okay, and we're not talking perfection, we're talking direction, right? The wife too can become entirely passive, right? Not the same as being submissive, contributing nothing to the decision-making process of the family. A wife can be subject to her husband and still participate fully in the decision-making process and being unwilling to confront her husband even when he is doing wrong. Again, she can become rebellious in her submission to her husband as well, right? Any one of these areas that where men are tempted to sin in, well, women will be tempted to sin in as well. And guys and gals, we have to fight against our own sinful tendencies for all of us. So is there hope? And I hope you guys are going to say, you bet, or you betcha. All right, look at the redemption of roles. Number 5B, just as redemption in Christ restores the image of God in the believer, so too redemption in Christ reaffirms the creation order. Amen. New Testament, we would expect that in Christ, redemption would encourage wives not to rebel against their husband's authority and would encourage husbands not to use their authority harshly. Why? Because in Christ, there is an undoing, that's your blank, of the painful aspects of the relationship that resulted from sin and the curse. Listen, for believers, genuine believers who both know the Lord, I have all the hope in the world for that relationship. 
You have all the resources in the world to have a great relationship, the best it can be this side of heaven, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, which is a sinful nature, right? But you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, according to 1 Timothy 4, 7, which is the whole theme of our summer series in, on Sunday. Colossians 3, 18, 19, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And then there's a bunch of verses. So, if it were a sinful pattern for wives to be subject to their husbands' authority, Peter and Paul would not have commanded it to be maintained in Christian marriages. Is that true? Absolutely. He would say, hey, don't do that now. Not necessary. Right? You've been redeemed by the blood of Christ and you know, we do away with all these roles. You didn't say that at all. You just double down on them, affirm them. New Testament commands concerning marriage, marriage do not perpetuate any elements of the curse or any sinful behavior patterns. They rather reaffirm the order and distinction of roles that were there from the beginning of God's good creation. Wayne Grudem said that. Another one from Grudem, there is an eternal beauty. I'll wait for you guys. There's eternal beauty and dignity and rightness in this differentiation, differentiation, excuse me, and roles both within the Trinity and within the human family. As we grow in maturity in Christ, we will grow to delight and rejoice in the God-ordained differences in our roles. Amen? Listen, I'm going to read that again because I didn't hear a very loud amen there. As we grow in maturity in Christ... Think through this with me. I know you guys are getting tired. We will grow to delight and rejoice in the God-ordained differences in our roles. Amen. Amen. And, you can add this, we will grow in our appreciation and respect of the other sex, the other gender, the other person. And I really mean that. God made man and woman right? To be a reflection of who he is in his image, according to his likeness. Now let's talk about the application of our roles. We got to keep going, don't we? When husbands begin to act in selfish, harsh, domineering, or even abusive and cruel ways, they should realize that this is, help me out with that three-letter word, sin. A result of the fall and destructive and contrary to God's purpose. Rather, husbands must earnestly strive to fulfill the New Testament commands to love their wives in a biblical Christ-like manner. You guys are familiar with this. Likewise, when wives feel rebellious or resentful of their husband's leadership, or when they compete with their husband for leadership in the family, they should realize that this is, thank you, a result of the fall and destruction excuse me, and destructive and contrary to God's purposes. A wife desiring to act in accordance with God's pattern should be submissive to her husband, respecting and rejoicing in the fact that God made him the leader in their home. Husbands should aim for loving, considerate, thoughtful leadership in their families. Guys, work hard at that. It's easier. I've been under bad leadership before, and I hated that. I really, really disliked that. I struggled with that. You guys ever had a bad boss? You know what I'm talking about? It's just really, really hard to go to work, really hard to respect that person, really struggle with that. And all good leaders have first learned to be good followers. Does that make sense? That's how you become a good leader. So you think like, okay, I'm not going to do it like that guy did or that, that lady did it. So... Wives should aim for active, intelligent, joyful submission to their husband's leadership. Then once again, another verse, Colossians 3, 18 through 19, just like the Ephesians passage, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. All right, do you guys feel guilty enough? <laughs> the next area of importance when discussing anthropology is the fall of man. Because this goes so deep. I mean, I mean, we have 90 minutes and we can cover a little bit, right? That's all we get. All right, fall of man. Genesis 3 does not describe the origin of sin itself, but it does describe the entrance of sin into the human race. Genesis 3 describes an actual historical event. Adam and Eve were real people who sinned against God in real time and space. 
The historicity of this event is essential if an analogy is to be seen in Romans 5, 12 through 21. If Adam was not a real creature who brought sin into the human race at one point in history, then there is no point to Jesus' redeeming humanity at another point in history. That's right. Christ's own testimony, however, confirms Adam and Eve as historical figures. Matthew 19, 3 through 5. First, in the fall of man, we saw the test, right? First came the test. During their life in the garden, God tested Adam and Eve regarding their obedience. My professor used to say it like this. Adam and Eve came into the world in a state of, this is how he described it, untested holiness. They were holy, but it was an untested holiness. And God put them in a garden. They said, you can have all the trees, the whole, God, whole, whole garden. And he put one tree, where was it? in the middle of the garden. Why didn't he put it up in the northern, northern eastern quadrant of the garden, right? They can walk around it day after day. No, they had to go past it, probably day after day. So he left that there as a test. He said, you can have everything, you just can't eat from this one tree. That's it. And they blew it. <laughs> All right. During their life in the garden, God tested them, Adam and Eve, regarding their obedience. They were free to eat of the fruit of any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The test was simple. It was to determine whether or not they would believe God and obey him. Disobedience would mean death, both physical and spiritual. And we come to the temptation. By the way, don't leave out Genesis when you're sharing the gospel. If you have the opportunity, if you have a, a few minutes to share the gospel, we'll always go back to the beginning. It makes so much more sense, right? When you bring it to the beginning, here's where the problem started, right? This explains why there's so much evil and death in the world, because there's sin in the world. And the rest of the Bible, right, is the explanation on how, came, how God came to solve it for us. That's all it is. So next is the temptation. The avenue through which the temptation came to Adam and Eve was the serpent. Genesis 3, 1, an actual animal created by God. However, the temptation must also be seen as coming through Satan. Don't, you have to distinguish between the serpent and Satan here. Even though the devil is called the serpent of old in Revelation 12, 9, 22, and the illusion in Romans 16, 20 indicates that the judgment of Genesis 3, 15 refers to Satan, not simply the serpent. Satan's strategy of temptation can be summarized in three phases. Here's his strategy, and he does the same, he uses the same tactics today. So don't get caught off guard. Number one, Satan raised doubt concerning God's word. Is our world trying to do that today? All the time. He created suspicion about the goodness of God, raising the question whether God was dealing wisely and fairly with Adam and Eve. Eve succumbed to the temptation in that she exaggerated God's prohibition in her response to Satan, Genesis 3.3. God had said nothing about not touching the fruit. Number two, Satan lied. So he first he creates doubt, then he goes for the full-on lie. By saying that they would not die, a categorical denial of God's earlier statement in Genesis 3, 4. Then number three, Satan told a partial truth, Genesis 3, 5, in a, in a um, half, a, half truth is a whole lie, right, as they say. Satan told them that they would be like God, knowing good and evil if they ate the fruit. It was true that they would know good and evil, but Satan did not tell them the rest. He did not tell them about the pain and the suffering, the death that would, that would occur through their sin. The test was in three areas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, exactly what 1 John 2.16 says. So, what was the punishment? First, Scripture tells us that he judged the snake, right? The results were terrible, as it says in your outline. And first he judged the serpent or the snake. The serpent had earlier been a noble creature. And as a result of the judgment, it was altered in form and shape. Because the serpent exalted itself, it would now be forced to crawl in his belly and eat the dust of the earth as it crawled along. 
Some people have, have postulated, so he, he must have had wings or legs or, or both, right? Something like that. But this was part of the, part of the fall. Second, he judged Satan. This is in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, this is usually where I take people when I explain the gospel, must be understood as addressed not to the serpent, but to Satan. There would be enmity between Satan's seed, unbelievers and possibly demons, and the woman's seed, believers and specifically Christ. He shall bruise you on the, on the head, the scripture says, indicates that Christ delivered a death blow to Satan at the cross. And we see that in Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2. Christ would have a major victory. You can fill that in. That's your blank, major. You shall bruise him on the heel, suggests Satan would have a minor victory. And the fact that Christ died, nonetheless, that death became Satan's own defeat. You guys, this prophecy, as I've mentioned many times from this pulp in the past, is known as the Proto-Evangelium. That is to say, it's a theological way of saying, as theologians say, it's the very first mentioning of the gospel in Scripture. Now, if Scripture is God's solving of our greatest problem, our greatest need, and that is our sin problem, here, right in the middle of all these curses, he curses, he curses the, the snake, then Satan, then the woman, and then Adam, and we're going to follow through that. But right in the middle is Genesis 3.15, and it's a promise to send a Savior. It's the first hint that there would be a Messiah, right? And praise God for that. That's the good news. Next comes the judgment on the woman. Genesis 3.16, the woman would experience pain, toil, in childbirth. Another aspect of the woman's judgment was that she would desire her husband's role, but he would rule over her. And finally, after everyone else was taken care of, God comes to the man last. First judgment on the man was against the ground. That's your blank. No longer would the earth spontaneously produce its fruit, but only through hard toil, pain, same Hebrew word, by the man. The second, the second judgment on the man was death. Adam had been made from the elements of the ground. The death process would return the man back to the dust from which his body had been taken. And that's why we die. That's a simple reason. The result of Adam's sin was passed on, you keep going down in your notes, on to the entire human race. All humanity now became subject to a sin nature, leading ultimately to death. That's why every person in every culture of every time period has died. Because Adam and Eve had children, they had children, they had children. That same sin nature was passed down. Keep going on. That also, that judgment also went to creation according to Genesis 3, 17, 18. All animal and plant life would also be affected by the sin of Adam. Animal life and nature would now resist man. Animals would become wild and ferocious. Plant life would produce weeds to hinder productivity. Thorns and thistles, right? All creation would groan with the effect of the fall and anxiously long for the day of restoration. Do you guys realize that all of creation groans? Our wonderful pets, our animals, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I love my pets, you love your pets, I'm sure. But these animals groan and they too, they are, were affected by the fall of, of mankind. But God's come to set us free from that too, and that's coming. Here it is, 6A, future glorification of man. Here's the, the best news of the night, okay? In his grand chapter of Romans 8, Paul lists the different facets of the jewel of salvation. I love this. This is known among theologians. You can write this down as the unbreakable chain. That's what my theology professor used to call it. This is Romans 8, 29 and 30. is called the unbreakable chain. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's read it together and you'll see. For those whom he foreknew, underline that. He also predestined, underline that. To become conformed to the image of his son, that's God's purpose, so that we would be the first, excuse me, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called, underline that. And these whom he called, he also 
justified, underline that word. And these whom he justified, he also what? Glorified, underline that word. These are five links in an unbreakable chain that God began. He foreknew, first link. Second link, predestined. Third link, right? Called. Fourth link, uh, justified. Fifth link, glorified. And what God starts, he always is, always finishes. The last piece of salvation is the believer's ultimate glorification. The effects of the fall will one day be completely reversed, praise God, and believers will once again be flawless image bearers, perfectly reflecting Christ for all of eternity. Look at 1 John 3, 2. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Amen. The curse will be lifted and God's perfect people will live in a perfect world. Once again, walking in perfect relationship with the creator, exactly as he meant it to be from the very, very beginning. Do you guys remember? It's only four chapters in the Bible that have no sin in them. The first two and the very last two. Everything else in the very middle is God's story of redemption. And it's a grand and glorious story. And I hope that you're actively sharing that with other people because it's good news. It really is. A couple more verses, then we'll be done. Revelation 22, 3. There will no longer be any curse. Amen. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things that passed away. Then one more. Revelation 22, 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And John says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. And God, all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you again and again for the glorious hope that we have. Lord, it's paradise was lost and you have set in motion a plan to restore paradise. And Lord, we are so thankful to be a part of that. God, thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for creating us in your image with what, what a wonderful privilege and, and station to, to have and to hold in your creation, to be really the pinnacle of the creation in this planet. We just thank you so much for that, Lord. Now, we pray that we would just honor you in every way possible. Lord, I pray for us to be the best reflectors of your image possible, that we would be the salt and light that this world needs to see, they need to see that there truly are genuine believers who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would be those, Lord. And I pray that we'd be bold witnesses to others around us. Oh, Lord, use us in an awesome way, in such a way that people that look would only say this is obviously the hand of God. And I pray that they would see that in our personal lives, our marriages, our homes, our families, in this church family. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. All God's people said, amen. amen. All right, you guys, whoa, I have like all this time, eight minutes. All right, now that's the best I've done this whole time here. All right, you guys, here's some books. I honestly had a, a little more difficult time picking out all these different books because there's so many different aspects to anthropology. So probably the best book on recovering biblical manhood and womanhood is a response to biblical uh, evangelical feminism from John Piper and Wayne Grudem, okay? This is like the one-stop shopping spot. If you are wondering about this on all the passages that God used to talk about the different roles the different plan that God has for men and women and that we're co-equal really in every way, you know I'm saying then this is the book that you want to read and it is an excellent book. So if you've been trained in, a, in thinking differently, then you might wanna pick that book up. The other one is just a standard, The Exemplary Husband by Stuart Scott, The Excellent Wife by Martha Peace. Usually my wife and I will use these books in our pre-marriage 
counseling. Then obviously I can talk a whole lot more about roles and all these other things and, and as uh, husbands, wives, and a marriage, but we'll leave that there. I just wanted a representation. And then just also what fits hand in glove with anthropology is biblical counseling. And um, Jay Adams, if you've ever heard of Jay Adams, he is known as the father of biblical counseling. He, in other words, he didn't discover it, but I would say he rediscovered it, just like Martin Luther didn't discover uh, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Um, it had just been lost for a while, and he studied the scriptures and came to this. Well, Jay Adams has basically said, listen, there's something better than secular counseling, and it is we, the God, God's word is sufficient, and it's all we need as believers to grow in our Christ-likeness, and I, would, I think he's absolutely right. You don't need secular psychology. All right, folks? And then this is just from Heath Lambert, an excellent book. It's called The Theology of Biblical Counseling. All right, this is also very, very practical. I thought about using this book too um, a while ago. And then things on cosmology, right, about creation. I've got so many books I can't even tell you on creation. This is one of my, I love this topic, I really, really do. And Heinz and the Apologetic Forum do a great job, so I would just recommend that you pick up every book that they have there on their, on their table. But one from John MacArthur's called The Battle for the Beginning, all right? so. Battle for the Beginning, Ken Ham, whom I love, right? Call him Canned Ham, all right, sorry. <laughs> okay, anything that Ken Ham puts out, okay, very good stuff. And then also a classic is called The Genesis Flood by John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. Just a classic book on biblical creationism, okay, or cosmology. All right, you guys, listen. Um, May God continue to bless you. Next week, we have, what do we have after anthropology? Soteriology. This is gonna be, I might need a few extra minutes. So I'll let you guys go a little extra early this time and maybe I can, make, maybe I can have them next week. <laughs> we'll talk about it next week, okay? Don't think about it too much. So soteriology and then Israelology. You are in for a huge treat there. I really mean that. And then ecclesiology, which is what? Study the church. And finally, one of my favorites, eschatology. All right, we'll wrap up the summer, and, uh, and hopefully you guys will have been blessed. So anyway, you're dismissed, and thank you guys very much.